sleep well in your beds. Because if this thing comes true, there ain't gonna be any more. Welcome to Watch Mojo. And today, we're counting down our picks for the top 30 underappreciated and underrated movies of the century so far. This is like nails on a chalkboard to me. Okay, go ahead. Chew like that. Chew like that all day. Number 30, Confessions of a Dangerous Mind. It's rather surprising this biopic didn't pick up more accolades. It was directed by George Clooney, written by Charlie Kaufman, and distributed by Miramax. Are you interested in the work? Well, it's a profile. We guess the studio was more interested in pushing its Oscar hopefuls. On top of that, Sam Rockwell was synonymous with the word underrated for a while. So it makes sense that his first major film as a lead would carry an underrated moniker as well. Rockwell shines as Chuck Barris, the famed game show host and creator who claimed in his autobiography to have worked as a CIA assassin. I just feel I deserve a little appreciation for my efforts here, Jim. Whether his story is mostly true or mostly fabricated, nobody can deny that it's fascinating. Number 29, 21 Grams. 21 Grams centers on three strangers who become intertwined in a web of guilt, grief, and glimpses of hope. It's beautiful. This gritty crime drama is the second in director Alejandro González Iñárritu's trilogy of death, the other two being Amores Peros and Babel. All three films take a non-linear approach with interwoven narratives, but 21 Grams is the one that often gets lost in the shuffle. And it's he who gives, and he who takes away. Yeah, right. He didn't give a shit about us. Throw in several tragically poetic twists, and you have a film that was never going to be a crowd pleaser. If you can handle the hard-hitting drama, though, you'll find an exceptionally crafted ensemble piece carried by powerful performances from Naomi Watts, Sean Penn, and Benicio Del Toro. Hell, this is hell. Right here! You're damning yourself. You shut up now and ask hey, Christ to forgive, forgive you. Forgive me! I did everything he asked me to do. Number 28, Buried. Buried is largely carried by its lead, Ryan Reynolds. Although Reynolds is widely known for his comedic chops, he gives his most intense performance here as Paul Conroy, an American who's buried alive in a wooden coffin. <coughs> this concept could have gotten old fast, but Buried is consistently harrowing. Reynolds makes the audience feel every ounce of desperation, paranoia, and fear that Paul experiences. Although the space is limited, the direction, editing, and cinematography make for a more visually varied film than one would anticipate. Do not go back to the house. Do not go back to the house. You can not go anywhere but the house, okay? These guys, they know where we live. They have my driver's license. Chris Sparling's script is full of surprises as well. This unsettling ride will leave the audience gasping to catch their breath until the final scene. Number 27, Good Time. The Safdie brothers are gaining a reputation for redeeming actors. For many years, Robert Pattinson was generally written off as the Twilight guy. After seeing Good Time, you'll be like, Edward who? Pattinson escapes into the role of Connie, a crook who tries to bust out his developmentally disabled brother after a robbery goes wrong. Following another trope that's common in the Safdies films, Connie makes one misguided choice after another. The Safdies are experts at turning New York into a maze where the walls are constantly closing in on the protagonist. Please, could you just put it down for two seconds and just listen to what I'm saying? There's no escape, but Connie keeps running away from trouble while also digging himself deeper into it. Good time isn't exactly a good time, although it is a nail-biting, adeptly made one. Call him now. Number 26, Jennifer's Body. But most of us were too numb to enjoy ourselves. Most of us. I don't know how we ended up here. I don't know, but it's never been so clear. Jennifer's Body combines elements of slasher films and teen comedies to crowd-pleasing effect. It also contains Megan Fox's greatest role as the central murderous entity. While Fox's bombshell status in blockbusters like Transformers pigeonholed her into certain parts, this movie allows her to subvert that position with a knowing wink. I gotta go. I am a god.
Okay. Her succubus character effectively woos and murders unsuspecting teenagers with her wicked charms. She and Amanda Seyfried star together in an unlikely friendship that brings a more female perspective to the genre. This horror adventure didn't get the love it deserved upon release, but people are coming around to it as much more than an average shock fest. What do you want from me? I just want to explain some things to you. Besides, best friends don't keep secrets, right? Number 25, The Nice Guys. They say Hollywood doesn't make quality comedies anymore. The truth is, they are out there, but audiences aren't seeking them out. The Nice Guys in particular warrants comparison to the best buddy comedies. Had the film come out in the same era as Midnight Run or 48 Hours, it would likely be regarded as a classic today. Audiences apparently weren't interested in a throwback in 2016, but The Nice Guys is draped in style, funny as hell, and enormously entertaining. Excuse me. My profession is very complicated, okay? It's nuanced. At the forefront is a spot-on dynamic between Russell Crowe and Ryan Gosling, although the film's cleverest crime fighter is Angowry Rice as Gosling's young daughter. With a Christmas backdrop, this film needs the die-hard treatment. Duck! What? Duck. Number 24, Moon. Another Sam Rockwell movie, Moon may have marked the actor's finest performance at the time. Yeah, you think too much, pal. Duncan Jones' directorial debut is practically a one-man acting showcase for Rockwell. Actually, we suppose you could call it a two-man showcase, seeing as how Rockwell shares the screen with himself. Sam Bell is an astronaut whose three-year mission is winding down. As matters get increasingly surreal on the lunar station, Bell comes face to face with his clone. Or is he the clone? You're the clone. Okay, Sam, we're not a clone. The original's identity is just one of the twists that makes Moon such a compelling watch. At its core, the film is about isolation and what it means to be human. Rockwell's performance overflows with relatable charm, solidifying him as one of the early century's most underrated talents. The satellite's fine. They don't want us to be able to contact Earth. They lied to us. They've been lying to us since the beginning. They've been lying to us since forever. Number 23, Ghost World. Not nearly enough people know about the wildly endearing and underappreciated Ghost World. Check out these people behind you. I'm totally convinced they're Satanists. Granted, this dark comedy did score an Oscar nomination for its screenplay, which Daniel Klaus adapted from his graphic novel with co-writer Terry Zweigoff. But where's Steve Buscemi's Best Supporting Acting nomination? Where's Thora Birch's Best Actress nomination? I can't believe they have him as the opening act and not the headliner. It's, it's what an insult. Accolades aside, why isn't Ghost World brought up more when we talk about the best generational movies? Perhaps the film was ahead of its time. Its wit, pathos and cynical charm feel eerily modern. Hey, look at it this way. At least things can't get any worse. Number 22, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Hi. Hey. So what do you do for a living? Uh, I'm retired. I invented dice when I was a kid. Oh. Shane Black was a hotshot screenwriter long before making Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. For his directorial debut, the Lethal Weapon scribe takes his knack for witty dialogue and buddy films to new heights. I apologize. That is a terrible scene. It's like, why was that in the movie? Gee, you think maybe it'll come back later? Robert Downey Jr. plays a guy who accidentally wins an acting role, studying for his part with the help of Val Kilmer's private eye. The dynamic pair gives the lively script the feel that all of the dialogue is completely off the cuff. Along with directing a fantastic cast, Black's infectious energy reaches to every corner of the project at a lightning pace. The entire production works both as an intriguing noir and a whip-smart comedy. Boils down to this. Veronica Dexter, yesterday afternoon, about 4.30, left her home. Yeah. Went up to the airport, picked up some dude, old boyfriend. Off she went. That was it. That was the last time anybody saw her. Number 21, Upgrade. Now more than ever, it's hard to say if technology is our friend or foe. Several movies have offered their two cents on the debate, and Upgrade is among the most inventive. I'm not looking to restart my life. I'm looking for the off switch. The film is carried by a magnetic performance from Logan Marshall Green as Gray, a man who's left paralyzed following a tragic mugging. The man who shot your wife, there's no gun in his hand. She was shot, that means he had a gun. She was shot, but not with a gun he was holding in his hand. A gun implanted inside his hand. 
Simon Maiden is equally strong as the voice of Stem, an AI implant who gives Grey a second chance at life and revenge. Stem, you can take over. Ah! Hi! Writer-director Lee Whannell crafts an involving mystery, but the real question throughout Upgrade is who's truly in the driver's seat, Grey or Stem? May I borrow your car? Stop! Number 20. Walk Hard, The Dewey Cox Story While it's hilarious, this spoof fell flat financially. Well, I think I'm doing okay for a 15-year-old with a wife and a baby. Despite coming out only a couple of years after Walk the Line and Ray, I guess the musical biopic still seemed like a fairly niche subgenre to parody in 2007. The 60s are an important and exciting time. Aren't they? It's like there's something happening here. With the subsequent releases of Love and Mercy, Bohemian Rhapsody, and Rocketman, though, people have become more conscious of the tropes we constantly see in these movies. With meditation, there's no limit to what we can imagine. Walk Hard is a clever send-up of these cliches, delivering some surprisingly catchy original songs and a great cast led by John C. Riley, who's also one of the century's most underrated comedic talents. You're not even half the boy that the top half of Nate was after you cut him in half. So you're saying I'm less than a quarter of the boy Nate was? Number 19. Bernie True crime stories have seen a rise in popularity throughout the century, but Bernie is one of the most unique and underappreciated approaches to the genre. I am so happy for you. Can I tell you, I am not fond of cremations. I just don't like the idea of someone spending eternity in something the size of a motel ice bucket. <laughs> We'd say that this is a mockumentary, but unlike This is Spinal Tap or Borat, there's actually a fair deal of truth to Richard Linklater's film. I can understand chewing each bite of some food 25 times like chicken fried steak but I don't think you have to chew your refried beans that many times. Jack Black gives one of his most charismatic performances as Bernie Titi, a real-life mortician who was put on trial for the murder of an elderly rich woman. But there's a lady, a member of this congregation, shot in the back four times and put in a freezer. Danny the Bernie you're talking about is not the Bernie this church knew. How the heck he didn't. While all signs point to Bernie's guilt, the town has a hard time believing that somebody so lovable could be responsible for taking a person's life. Likewise, it's easy for the audience to forget that such a charming film is based on a heinous crime. Number 18. It Comes at Night Based on the title and advertisements, people went into It Comes at Night expecting a more traditional apocalyptic horror film. Rather than solely relying on jump scares and gore, Trey Edward Schultz's film delivered a far more understated and physiological experience. Above all else, this is a morality tale that examines how far a family will go to preserve their own lives. We just want what's fair. We want enough food and enough water, then we're gonna go, and you're never gonna see us again. Instead of a big scary monster, the audience pulls back the curtain to find a mirror. The lack of a straightforward villain, coupled with a slow pace, may have caused the film to fall through the cracks. For fans of classic Twilight Zone episodes like The Monsters Are Due on Maple Street, you'll appreciate the film's haunting and even timely themes. Number 17. Brick. How were you introduced to Ryan Johnson? Probably through his more mainstream work like Star Wars The Last Jedi. For many critics, though, it was clear that Johnson had the makings of an audacious filmmaker based on his directorial debut, Brick. Brad's the school's biggest Jake buyer, so if his pin is behind all the selling, I just got his attention. Anyway, now we've shaken the tree, let's wait and see what falls on our heads. Just as Knives Out brought the murder mystery into the 21st century, Brick is a classic film noir set in a modern high school. I think the third man needs 10 things I hate about you. On a shoestring budget of only $450,000, Johnson delivers a stylized homage to detective stories that's elevated by a witty screenplay and a hard-boiled performance from Joseph Gordon-Levitt. You held gold like a car till you can play them for money! I don't know what you're talking about. You buried me at the same time, but it was mostly for the money. Now that Johnson's profile has risen significantly, you owe it to yourself to catch up with this bullseye. Number 16. Miami Vice It's no wonder Miami Vice underperformed at the box office back in 2006. Somebody something's gotta go somewhere, somewhere. Not too distant in the future. It came out at a time when Hollywood was giving every retro TV show the big screen treatment. And we mean every show. It was easy for Miami Vice to get lost in a shuffle that included Bewitched and the Dukes of Hazzard. Havana. Cubans don't like my business. And they don't like my passport. Unlike those movies, this adaptation took a nostalgic property and evolved it for modern audiences. 
At the time, critics negatively compared the film to its source material and Michael Mann's previous efforts. Now that the dust has settled, many have cited the film's stellar cinematography and graphic action as an inspiration. It even made Time Out's list of the 101 best action movies ever made. Number 15. Be Kind Rewind It's surreal to think that few people born in the 2010s would recognize a video rental store. Be Kind Rewind came out shortly before chains like Blockbuster and Hollywood Video bowed out. All of the tapes are like this. All the tapes, I tried every tape. When all the tapes at a struggling video store are erased, most deaf and Jack Black decide to reshoot each film. Rock and roll! How's it look? Amazing. Very real. Yeah. Be Kind Rewind will not only resonate with fans of classic films, but also anyone who grew up making home movies with no budget. Looking back now, the film reminds us of something we've lost in the streaming era, how video stores brought people together to share their passion for cinema. Had the film come out today, we have a feeling it would have made a stronger impression in the nostalgic zeitgeist. I will shoot you, and I know robot karate. Number 14. Silence Having gained a reputation as one of our greatest filmmakers, it's not often that we see a Martin Scorsese picture go unnoticed by audiences. What's especially surprising about Silence is that it didn't even generate much noise at the Academy Awards. We asked for this mission, Francisco. We prayed for this in the exercises. God heard us then, and he hears us now. Despite garnering positive reviews across the board, the film only got one Oscar nomination for Rodrigo Prieto's captivating cinematography. I thought that martyrdom would be my salvation. Please, please, God, do not let it be my shame. Silence deserved so much more award attention for Scorsese's ambitious direction and Andrew Garfield's heartbreaking lead performance. Think about the suffering you have inflicted on these people just because of your selfish dream of a Christian Japan. Garfield is nothing short of phenomenal as a Jesuit priest torn between his faith and survival in a grueling environment. Maybe it was the epic runtime of 161 minutes that turned people off, but a film of this magnitude should not go speechless. Number 13. Upstream Color With 2004's Primer, director Shane Carruth delivered one of the century's strangest, most unforgettable examples of experimental filmmaking. Almost 10 years later, Carruth returned with a follow-up film that's every bit as bizarre. Um, I am divorced. That's not good, right? It's not great. Yeah. It's a classic story of boy meets girl, although Chris and Jeff have more in common than they initially realize. By all appearances, you're a survivor of stage three endometrial cancer. The good news is that there isn't any sign of any remaining carcinoma. Lab shows that you're in no immediate danger. Both were exposed to a parasite that's transferred from humans to pigs to orchids. Yeah, based on that description, you can probably tell if upstream color will be your cup of tea. For those with an open mind, though, this is an unusually beautiful story about the search for identity and how love can blossom in the most unlikely places. Number 12. Synecdoche, New York When some people can't even pronounce the title, chances are a movie isn't going to pack theaters. Even if you did catch Synecdoche, New York during its initial run, there's a good chance you wrote it off as pretentious nonsense. It's all about your artistic satisfaction, Caden. It may take some time to reflect upon and even multiple viewings, but more and more people are starting to see the brilliance of Charlie Kaufman's film. Stop! Where is she? What'd you do to my daughter? Kaufman transforms Synecdoche into a surreal playground, crawling with rich symbolism, finding the point where realism and absurdity intersect. I watched you forever, Caden, but you've never really looked at anyone other than yourself. So watch me. Watch my heartbreak. Watch me jump. <laughs> if it flew under your radar, went over your head, or you just need a reminder of how incredible Philip Seymour Hoffman was, check out why Roger Ebert named this the best film of the 2000s. Number 11. Anomalisa From one Charlie Kaufman film to another, Anomalisa demonstrates why the 21st century has been a golden age for feature animation. Unfortunately, animated movies tailored exclusively for adults remain a tough sell. Why did, why did you go, Michael? I don't know. I can't explain. Co-directed by stop-motion artist Duke Johnson, Anomalisa brings out the whimsy and the mundane in a man's midlife crisis. Do you need to find your friend, though? No. Two beautiful ladies trumps my friend. The characters may be puppets, 
but few films overflow with more raw humanity. Everyone in Michael Stone's world blends into one another. That is, except for one woman he encounters on a business trip. I understand that you had a guest in your room last night. Is that a crime? No, not at all. Certainly hoteliers are in the business of being discreet about our guests slandering. Could this stranger be the key to Michael's happiness, or is he simply caught up in the moment? In any case, this is a peculiar, humorous, and provocative triumph that's unlike anything you've ever seen. It truly is an anomaly. This is so great. Anomaly, sir. Number 10. Dread. It's a shame that when most people hear the title Dread, the first thing they think of is that Sylvester Stallone train wreck. If you do not comply, the sentence is death. For those who've seen Pete Travis's wickedly entertaining reboot, you know that Carl Urban's portrayal of Dread makes for one of the coolest action heroes to come out of this century. I'm wondering when you'd remember you left your helmet behind. Sir, a helmet can interfere with my psychic abilities. I think a bullet might interfere with them more. Returning to the character's hard-hitting, mysterious roots, this is the gritty interpretation that comic book fans waited years for, but hardly anyone turned up to see. Audiences were quick to pass judgment, missing out on a thrilling, expertly crafted, and character-driven extravaganza. I'll choke on it, Dread. While the cult following for Dread is growing, we're still waiting to hear more about the TV series announced to be in development as of 2017. Number 9. A Most Violent Year Oscar Isaac gives a multi-layered performance as Abel Morales, who's not exactly a gangster, but not exactly a legitimate businessman either. You have your job to do, but know that you're wrong, and we will take advantage of every opportunity to prove that. Turning to criminals for help, Abel does everything he can to keep his hands clean, but still finds blood on them. What's with the gun? I told you, I wasn't gonna continue to stand around and let these people come and get me and my children. Jessica Chastain steals the show as Abel's wife, who's like Lady Macbeth if she were a New Yorker in the 1980s. A Most Violent Year stands out as this century's only film that won the National Board of Review's top prize, but didn't go on to receive any Oscar nominations. Your friend is dead! Who hired you? It's possible that Academy members and audiences were caught off guard by the movie's tone, which is far less bombastic than its title suggests. Nevertheless, few modern crime dramas have been more compelling. Number 8. 25th Hour 25th Hour was one of the first films to address the 9-11 attacks, but it didn't start out with that intent. There's something fluffy in here, Mr. Brogan. You know, it's a good thing I found this. It's gonna make your sofa so much more comfortable to sit on. The film was actually in development around the same time America faced its darkest day, promoting director Spike Lee to weave the tragedy into the story. Just get him drunk. Make sure he has one last good night. The film is primarily set in 2002, as Edward Norton's Monty faces his final 24 hours before a seven-year prison sentence. He'll be a 38-year-old punked-out ex-con with, with government-issued dentures. 38 is still young. Are you gonna get out? You and me, we're gonna start something up? Although 9-11 isn't the focus, Monty's feelings of anger, fear, and uncertainty tapped into what many people were experiencing. It may not be Lee's best-known joint, but 25th Hour captured the end of an era and the trauma that's still felt today. It's only grown more profound, being featured on various Best of the Decade lists. Number 7. Master and Commander – The Far Side of the World Granted, Master and Commander did receive 10 Oscar nominations, including one for Best Picture. And never leave your happy house to celebrate Since then, however, people rarely seem to talk about this adaptation of Patrick O'Brien's historical novel. Even when the film came out, it didn't make the biggest splash at the box office. Now don't count your eggs before they're in the pudding, Mr. Calamy. Still? If we can close this gap and get up behind us, she may well be ours. Perhaps the film's underperformance can be attributed to bad timing. It was released only a few months after another high sea adventure, Pirates of the Caribbean, and a month before another cinematic epic, Return of the King. It's leadership they want. Strength. Now you find that within yourself, and you will earn their respect. Audiences missed out on one of the century's most rousing achievements complete with mind-blowing cinematography from Russell Boyd, daring direction from Peter Weir, and a gripping performance from Russell Crowe. It's definitely one we would love to see re-released on the big screen. Ah! Ah! 
Number 6. Pop Star – Never Stop, Never Stopping Almost a decade after Walk Hard, audiences overlooked another musician satire that deserved to perform much better. Karate God, you kidding me, man? That song changed my life. Helmed by Andy Samberg, Akiva Schaffer, and Yorma Taconi, also known as The Lonely Island, this mockumentary is essentially a series of SNL digital shorts, loosely tied together by a plot. No, like, it's a negative four out of ten. Positive ten, I assume. Maybe. Pitchfork can be kind of pretentious, though, so… That may not sound very engrossing, but the film is not intended to be plot-driven. It is driven by laughter, and pop star never stops tickling your funny bone. I heard he's getting into stage gimmicks now. He's got Owen in a helmet looking dumb, and one where he sings from a toilet. Being a Lonely Island production, the film has no shortage of memorable tunes, from Turn Up the Beef to I'm So Humble. I'm so humble. So expensive! I'm so humble! Of course, the best is an ode to the assassination of Osama bin Laden. Backed up by a never-ending supply of cameos, Popstar is funnier and smarter than anyone likely anticipated. Number 5. Take Shelter Take Shelter is everything that the happening should have been. With echoes of Hitchcock, the film includes a riveting performance from Michael Shannon as Curtis Lafourche. Haunted by dreams and visions, Curtis is convinced that a devastating storm is on the horizon. Yet nobody shares Curtis's concerns, and his mother's history of mental illness only gives us more reason to believe he's going crazy. There was always a, a panic that took hold of me. Thus ensues a tense psychological thriller about a man who's either saving or endangering his family. When I build out the tornado shelter in my backyard, I could use some help. The hell you want to do that for? Although Take Shelter leaves much up to interpretation, it's not hard to think of climate change as Curtis tries to open everyone's eyes to a looming disaster. There is a storm coming! Like nothing you have ever seen! In that sense, the film only grows more relevant and unsettling with each passing year. Number 4. Under the Silver Lake Under the Silver Lake starts off with a typical neo-noir setup, as slacker Sam, played by Andrew Garfield, searches for a mysterious woman who disappeared overnight. I don't understand why she didn't tell me. Well, I don't know. Maybe she didn't like you. Maybe she knows you're poor and haven't paid your rent. The conspiracy Sam uncovers is anything but conventional, however. To give away any more information would do this twisted, borderline comedic thriller a disservice. Check it out, man. Silver Lake from above. Let's just say that the first 10 minutes barely touch upon the cryptic insanity that ensues. Some movies take us down the rabbit hole, but this movie takes us to places that would make the Mad Hatter's Tea Party look like a laid-back lunch. A film like this was far too unreal to ever be a mainstream success. That song was not written on distorted guitar. No. I wrote it here on piano somewhere between a blowjob and an omelet. Like Blue Velvet or Mulholland Drive, though, we want to dissect every inch of it. Number 3. Prisoners Anna! Girls? Visionary filmmaker Denis Villeneuve's Prisoners takes a dark look at the disappearance of two children and the ensuing investigation. Hugh Jackman plays the father that will do anything to find his daughter, even going so far as to kidnap and torture a potential suspect. This is the only way. Have you lost your mind, Keller? Do you have a better idea, Franklin? Did he? As Jackman's character loses his soul, Jake Gyllenhaal's detective struggles to fight the case from the right side of the law. Both actors deliver some of their most underrated work, questioning the concept of justice and morality in a cruel world. Villeneuve and cinematographer Roger Deakins create a moody template for a psychological mystery that borders on horror in the best way possible. Probably. Am I a suspect? No, no, I'm only asking. I'm only asking because you assaulted a man who's now missing. I heard about that. What happened? I thought you had him under surveillance. I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume that you're asking me because you have no idea. No, I didn't think it was something I could get away with. Number 2. The Assassination of Jesse James by the Coward Robert Ford We can think of a few reasons why nobody saw this revisionist western. Hey, boys! These all for me? The runtime clocks in at 160 minutes, and the title is just as long-winded. On top of that, the title kind of gives away a major spoiler. 
Even with that knowledge, however, Jesse James is a tense drama about a notorious outlaw and the young admirer destined to betray him. You have blue eyes, I have blue eyes. You're five feet eight inches tall, I'm five feet eight inches tall. Despite the constant reminders of what's coming, it's the dynamic between these characters that keeps us at the edge of our seats. The story takes its time, but the inevitable final destination continues to haunt us. I'll say, how did you get to reach your 20th birthday without leaking out all of your clothes? And if I don't like his attitude, I will slit that filled doodle so deep he will flop on the floor like a fish. Along the way, we're treated to some superb cinematography courtesy of Roger Deakins. In many respects, this is the Coen Brothers movie the Coens never made. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Zodiac When Zodiac was released back in 2007, only two other films made it onto more critical best of the year lists. When critics compiled a list of the 21st century's best films thus far in 2016, Zodiac was ranked number 12. I killed a guard escaping from prison in Montana. I'm not doing anything, okay? I'm not afraid to kill again. Yet, for whatever reason, this remains director David Fincher's unsung masterpiece, having bombed financially and received no Oscar nominations. I also told him we don't think this is Zodiac. Okay, wait a minute. You don't think this is Zodiac? We got a guy we like for it. We don't have enough to pin it on him yet, but we're pretty sure it's him. If you don't think this is Zodiac, then why give anything to Avery? Considering that the Zodiac killer was never caught, you'd think that this film would feel like an unfinished puzzle. Even if pieces are missing, Zodiac is the whole package. Skillfully made, perfectly cast, and shockingly faithful to Robert Graysmith's nonfiction book. It's a fascinating thriller that constantly leaves us guessing if we're watching a game of cat and mouse or a dog chasing his own tail. Which of these films do you think deserves more love? Let us know in the comments below. You're in the pool? Yeah. Why? I had to question the mermaids. Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.